D did your instructor mm -hmm. talk about hinges at all in class? No. Oh, he didn't use that word, huh? No. Well, uh, I'm not no, sure exactly not what uh, term he might have used, but we have to assume that the boom is not just resting against the wall, but is attached to the wall by a hinge. That's kind of the common sense of the situation. So there's going okay. to be a hinge force, a force from the hinge on the beam. A force from the hinge uh, on the beam, in this case. Uh, and we can go right, uh, uh, just go right ahead and break that uh, into components over here. So um, what would be the components, uh, so horizontal and vertical, let's just take a guess as to what the directions of those would be. So it, um, take a guess, what do you think was, is going to be the yep. direction of the horizontal hinge force? Is the hinge going to be pulling the, the boom left or right? Is the hinge going to be what? I'm sorry? Is the hinge force going to be to the left or to the right? Is the hinge going to be pushing the beam, be pushing the boom to the right or pulling it to the left? Pulling it to the left. Okay, now that's just a guess. If we think about it a little bit more, though, we can see the hinge force has to be to the right. Right, so you've got the hinge there, and you've got um, the boom attached to it, so you've got to have the force coming. Right, but it would be put, wouldn't it be... Okay, no, that's, that's the reason good. that the hinge force has to be to the right is that it's going to be balancing the tension force, which is to the left. Oh, well, okay. right, right, right. Well, I had the same idea in my head. Okay, I see what you're okay. saying. The tension is tending to pull the boom to the left. There has to be something balancing mm -hmm. that, pushing it to the right. Uh, otherwise, right. the boom wouldn't really be static. Remember, this is a statics problem. Okay. Um, and okay. then we also have a vertical component. Uh, it's not really obvious in this case whether the vertical component should be up or down. We just pretty much have to uh, take a guess as far as that's concerned um, because it has to balance. Uh, there's some downward forces and an upward force here. So uh, just take a guess. Well, what would be your guess as to what the direction of um, the... I think it would have to be up because to keep the boom from going down, from dropping down, to keep it up at a vertical, okay. I mean at a horizontal So we'll take a guess that the hinge that force is up. We don't really know whether it yeah. is or not, but we've taken that guess. So we called that up. Okay. Keep in mind, these are not normal, these are not ordinary normal forces. A normal force is what you would feel with the, if the boom was just resting against the wall. If the boom was just resting against the wall, then we would know there has to be a normal force pushing to the right, uh, pushing away from the surface. Um, because uh, a normal force okay. can only push away from a surface. But a hinge, when you're attached to a hinge, the hinge can push and pull you in any direction that it feels like. Uh, you know that if you say, look at the, the hinges on your door. If you think about the hinges on your door, well, the hinges on your door prevent you from pulling the door to the left or to the right or pulling it up or pulling it down. The hinge force will just be whatever direction it takes to keep the door in place. So the common sense of the situation right. here is that the boom is attached to the wall by a hinge. It's not really obvious exactly what those forces are, but we'll break those into components. All right, so those are our two components there. Okay. So those are all the things that are touching the object. Those are all the things that are touching uh, the object right now. Uh, all right, so we've identified all the forces, and now um, we can start uh, attacking this using uh, Newton's second law. We can start attacking this problem using uh, Newton's second law. So uh, what are the equations for uh, Newton's second law? Well, remember there is net force x. Force x equals mAx. Net force x equals what are our other equations? And it's net um, force y equals MAY. And we also now have Newton's second law for rotation. What was our Newton's second rotation. law for rotation? That is um, net uh, let me here. It is net torque equals inertia I omega alpha. Alpha. So the net <laughs> torque equals the moment of inertia times alpha I times A. Okay. So those are all the different versions of Newton's second law here. So now we simply have to choose one of those equations to apply to this oh. case. All right, so yeah, net torque equals I times alpha. That should be common sense that that's the right equation because alpha is the analog to A, right? Right. Okay. So um, now we have to choose which of these three equations is going to be uh, helpful for us uh, in this case. Um, so I'm just going to tell you um, that we're going to use the net torque equation. Uh, you probably might have guessed that because this is the chapter on rotation, right? So um, we're probably mm -hmm. going to need that net torque equation. Um, so uh, we're going to go through now and uh, try to use that equation. All right, so uh, let's see. In order to figure out that equation, we're going to have to list all the torques, right? 
who are going right. to have to know all the torques um, so that we can list them on the left-hand side. So how do you find the torques? Well, every single force could, it could give you a torque. So we have to go through all the forces we've identified and decide whether they're going to give us a torque or not. So if you look at that handout, we can use the, the part in the middle, I think, that talks about how to find torques, right? So what's the first step? Right. What's the first step in that process for determining a torque? You draw the the F, the force vector at its point of application. So you determine your your um, your force vector. That's right. And notice that we've already done that, right? We've already identified right. all the forces, and we've determined the ones we could. We've determined the weights. We can't really determine. Um, we can't determine the tension and the hinge forces yet because we weren't told that. So we've determined as much as we can. All right. Um, and okay. then, um, how, how about step two? What's that? Uh, the axis of rotation, okay. which would be the... Now, what would be our hinge, axis of rotation here? The hinge? Yeah, the best thing to choose is... No, no, no. Yeah. yeah. So there's two ways to think about that. First of all, remember, this is a little bit counterintuitive because, of course, this is a statics problem. We don't want this object to rotate, right? We don't want this object to rotate. Um, but if the object was right. going to rotate, what point would it rotate around? Well, it would rotate around the hinge. So it is most natural to choose mm -hmm. the hinge as the pivot. So I'm going to put a great big dot here to remind us that that's going to be our pivot. Okay. All right. So this hinge uh, point is uh, the pivot. Okay. okay. Um, and by the way, um, we should be working with one force at a time. So pick a force. Uh, wh which force do you guys want to start with? So. We could do the um, the force of the boom. Yeah, the weight of the boom. That, that's a good choice. Let's start with that. Okay. So we're focusing on the weight of the boom. All right, and now we have to decide whether we should be using the left-hand approach or the right-hand approach, right? Because there's two different approaches. Um, and I think mm -hmm. I mentioned that if you're not given an angle, you should probably use the right-hand approach, right? If you're not given right. an angle, you should use the right-hand approach. So um, let, let's use that right-hand approach now for the weight uh, of the boom. So what, what would be step three? To draw our um, our uh, our vector okay. from the axis of rotation. Now, when we did this before, we saw that we should keep drawing new pictures. So I'm going to draw um, a new picture here to help us uh, do that. So here we have the weight of the boom, which is 490 newtons. Uh, okay. So um, and here's our pivot. All right. So you tell me. So yeah, wh what are we drawing again? We're drawing the R uh, vector from the axis of rotation to the point of application. Now that would be the uh, left-hand approach, right? Oh yes. Yeah, Th that actually would um, work fine here. That would work okay. But let's use the right-hand approach instead. Okay. So in the right-hand approach, um, we should be drawing R perpendicular, right? Yeah, the R, under, R perpendicular. And it goes from where to where? Which it's going to go from the from the center of the pivot to the center of the of the weight of the boom. Yeah, it's going to go from the pivot perpendicular to the line of the force. From the pivot, mm -hmm. perpendicular to the line of the force. That would be our R perpendicular vector here. It really doesn't matter in this case whether you use R or R perpendicular because they both go. They both look the same. R and R perpendicular yeah. both would look the same. So that would be our R perpendicular. And um, I don't know if I included okay. that in the handout, but at the same time that we draw that, we should also determine it if we can. Do we know how long that is? 2.5 oh, meters. That was given meters, to us in the yeah. problem as 2.5 mm -hmm. meters. We'd already been told that that distance was 2.5 meters. All right, so now we know our perpendicular. Okay, so uh, what's the next step? So the next step is to do um, another force. Uh, I think we just did uh, step three, right? We just did, oh, skip step four. Skip step four. Oh, determine the sign of our, um, of our torque. So we need the torque from the weight of the boom. positive and negative. That's going to be negative mm -hmm. because, so we should have chosen, uh, well, what are, we, what are we choosing as our positive direction here? We should have chosen a positive direction. What do you want to be our positive direction? Clockwise. Uh, yeah, that's fine. Clockwise. Clockwise? Okay. Now, um, it's a little bit more conventional to choose counterclockwise. Uh, in this case, let's choose counterclockwise. It doesn't really matter, but let's choose counterclockwise here, okay. if you'll humor me about that. Okay. All right, so we'll choose counterclockwise okay. as our positive direction. Okay, so then um, is this going to be a clockwise or a counterclockwise torque? Here's the pivot. I'm having a hard time knowing what this is even rotating. There's just a hinge. Well, I guess if it's going 
counterclockwise is going to be perfect. I didn't think the negative. The first step is simply to decide whether the weight of the hinge would tend to uh, cause a clockwise rotation or a counterclockwise rotation. Now we know that in actuality the beam is not going to rotate at all. We know the boom is not going to rotate at all. Uh, but imagine right. that the weight did cause it to rotate. And what point is it going to be rotating around? Well, the pivot, right? We've chosen this as the pivot. Mm -hmm. So if the weight did cause the boom to rotate, would it cause it to rotate clockwise around the pivot or counterclockwise? I think clockwise. Clockwise. You guys don't sound too confident to right. about that, but wouldn't it start looking like this, right? The, the, mm -hmm. beam, the boom would look like this. The weight would be pulling it down like this. That's a clockwise rotation, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, this is a clockwise torque. CW for clockwise. Is that positive or negative? Clockwise would be um, negative. Because we chose counterclockwise as positive. Okay, so we've accomplished our step five. We've determined the sign of that torque.